Barry Luis, uh, so nice to see you joining me today, dear friends. Uh, I was told that many will be at another meeting today, but I uh, appreciate you making the time uh, to join me. Uh, today, I'm going to be doing something a little different. I'm going to be uh, talking uh, about physics. Uh, and so uh, some of you may think this, you know, is uh, uh, esoteric and not relevant to your practice, but I'll try to demonstrate uh, in several ways how you're going to uh, find this is going to help you deal with a lot of the artifacts that you see on imaging and how you make choices about uh, how you scan your patients. In the end, we'll talk a little bit about MRA, which I promised at the beginning. Uh, some of these images come from a book I did some years ago called Practical MR Physics. Uh, and um, if you're interested in this topic, uh, certainly uh, would be worth your time to go through that book. I wanted to talk uh, here at the beginning just about three Tesla and 1.5 Tesla imaging, uh, because uh, this uh, gets us started in, in uh, down this road of how physics uh, is relevant uh, to imaging. Uh, initially, three Tesla imaging was portrayed as a win-win situation in the notion being that uh, since you have more signal to noise, that only good can come from that. But I want to show you why there are compromises made when you go to three Tesla images and how you, uh, you gain in some ways and you lose in some ways as well. Uh, this is uh, uh, two different patients, obviously, but patients uh, that were scanned, uh, the image on your left, the patient was scanned in 1986 on a 0.5 Tesla resistive magnet. I don't think anyone is still using resistive magnets, but that's what we had uh, at the early uh, clinical uh, use of MR. Uh, and then the image on 2005 is from a 1.5 Tesla superconducting magnet. So uh, you would say, well, more is better in this case. And, and that's true that we there were a lot of benefits in going to 1.5 uh, Tesla, but the logical extension of three Tesla was not as transparent. And so uh, some of the things we'll consider <coughs> as we talk about three Tesla imaging are safety and power deposition, tissue contrast, susceptibility effects, chemical shift, and GAD contrast conspicuity. So when you go to a more powerful uh, magnet, uh, the risk from projectiles in the scanner room go up. And I'm not sure what the experience is there in Armenia, but certainly in the United States, there have been numerous accidents in, uh, in MR uh, scanning rooms. And I would say the majority of them go unreported. Uh, I remember one day at work passing by one of the scanner rooms and you could see the handle of a mop sticking out of a, a scanner and they had hung a curtain on the window so people didn't notice. But uh, these accidents do occur and the risk to the patient is greater at three Tesla because of the stronger field strength. The other issue which is much uh, more commonplace and in a sense it occurs in every patient is the heating that occurs at three Tesla. And so some medical devices that you would consider safe to image at 1.5 Tesla, such as uh, uh, implanted brain stimulators, they recommend not imaging at three Tesla because of increased power deposition. And so as you design pulse sequences at three Tesla, you must consider power deposition uh, because uh, it's uh, gonna be greater now, why is power deposition greater at three Tesla? If you think about, um, uh, I don't know, uh, in, certainly in parts of the United States, uh, you'll hear this loud music coming from cars. And, and if you've ever had that experience of listening to what uh, uh, is being played in a car next to you at loud volume, mostly what you hear are the bass sounds. So lower frequency waves propagate more easily. And they propagate more easily in the body uh, as well. And so as we go to higher frequency, and remember that the resonant uh, frequency of protons 
is proportional to the field strength. So instead of uh, 128 megahertz at three, uh, at I'm sorry, 64 megahertz at 1.5 Tesla, we're now dealing with 128 megahertz at three Tesla. So because the frequency is higher, the in a sense the penetration is less through the tissue, and so you need more power to deposit energy throughout the body. And this results not in a doubling of uh, power deposition, but a fourfold increase in power deposition. Uh, this is from the Medtronic uh, uh, deep uh, brain stimulating units, which are uh, often used in patients with Parkinson's disease. And so they say specifically here uh, 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 to recommend only 1.5 Tesla imaging, not three Tesla imaging. And of course, use of a transmit uh, receive coil. Higher field strength also has effects on tissue contrast. So the tissue T1 is longer in three Tesla since energy transfer is less efficient at these higher frequencies. That means tissue decreases in the brain at three Tesla. And so you would, again, if as we look at these two images, this actually is the same patient. And you look at these two images, and if we were to grade the uh, quality of the image, you, I think to me, visually, the image on the left shows this uh, area of T2 prolongation in the cord uh, better. But you notice on the three Tesla image uh, compared to the 1.5 image, it's paradoxically less. And so this comes back to this notion of tissue contrast. We, have, we went to higher field strengths, but as a result, we have lower, more power deposition and lower tissue contrast. Look at these two images. Now, again, these are obviously in different planes, but these are both uh, post-contrast T1 weighted imaging. Now on the image on the left, you can see the gray-white differentiation here in the region of the insula. On the image on your right, you know, it kind of has this gray look to it. And this is the three Tesla image, and this is the uh, 1.5 Tesla image on your left. Chemical shift effects are greater also at higher, uh, uh, magnet strength. These are the results of the change in the resonant frequency uh, of protons depending on their molecular bonds. So in the way that protons are bound in fat and the way protons are bound in water, they result in small differences in resonant frequency. And if, you're, if you follow the physics of uh, MR imaging and its early days, uh, it's used in uh, chemistry for, uh, as an NMR unit. It was these chemical bond uh, differences in resonant frequency that allowed distinction of different um, constituents of the sample that was being studied in the MR scanner. So, so this is a underlying uh, a principle of uh, resonance. With imaging, we see that this resonant difference in resonant frequency is visible at this fat water interface. And since we rely on the frequency of precession to localize the returning signal, any alteration in proton precession frequency will result in spatial misregistration. So at fat water interfaces, this results in a dark line on one side and a bright side on the other side. And this always occurs in the frequency encoding direction. And as a reminder, you know, you're probably all aware of that, but the, um, but the uh, images, the way that we think about the image reconstruction, uh, on every MR image, there is a frequency encoding direction and a phase encoding direction. Phase encoding direction is the direction where we see the motion artifacts, the, and, and so we, it, once we know that, we can determine which is the frequency encoding direction. You shouldn't expect that it's always up or down or side to side, because the operator of the magnet has the choice of determining which direction is going to be phase and frequency. Now, if you look on this image, you'll see around the kidneys, which are surrounded by retroperitoneal fat, that there's a white line on this side of the kidney and a black line on this side of the patient's opposite kidney. So this is a reflection of chemical shift. So we have 
Uh, and again, I, I've tried to represent in the drawing, and it's a little counterintuitive, but what I'm showing is that the misregistration between fat and water in terms of the kidney and the and retroperitoneal fat means that we have this area on one side where we get no signal. Now, I know it's shown as white, but, but in a sense, this is the area of black where there's no signal coming back. And on this side, there's doubling of signal, right? So we have the signal both of the fat and the kidney. And so on this side, we get high signal intensity. So this is the nature of chemical shift. And these chemical shift artifacts will be more apparent at three Tesla. Now, uh, sometimes this is clinically important because here on this image, you can see uh, it looks like there's this area of T1 um, short material surrounding the brain in between, here you can see the outer table and there's probably the diploic space here. So this looks a little bit like a subdural, but if you look on the flare image, we have no signal abnormality that corresponds. And so this, this is the, the beauty of MR imaging is when you have multiple pulse sequences, you can then sort through what, whether you're looking at something that's real or something that's an artifact. And in this case, this is an artifact uh, this is a chemical shift artifact at three Tesla. Now, is this where, what is this arising from? This is misregistration that's occurring uh, between, probably between the diploic fat and water. And you can see that there's a little bit of a phase uh, artifact going this way. So this is gonna be the phase encoding direction. This is the frequency encoding direction. So this is a chemical shift artifact. Here, this is a sebaceous cyst. And if we look at the sebaceous cyst here in the subcutaneous fat, uh, you can see that there's a dark line on one side and faintly seen bright line on the other side. So think to yourself, which direction must the frequency direct encoding direction? Well, again, if the dark line is on the top and the white line is on the bottom, that means the frequency encoding direction has to be uh, ver in the vertical direct dimension. So how can you tell the frequency encoding direction? Look for the motion artifacts. Here you have a CSF pulsation artifact, and you see the ghosts here of the pulsation of the fluid in the thecal sac projected in this direction. This is probably arising from this vasculature, but this way we know that this is going to be the phase encoding direction. So the frequency direction has to be left right in this case. So you can use this in any case where you're trying to sort through whether you think you're looking at a chemical shift artifact, look for the phase encoding artifact, which you can usually find on your PAX monitor if you try to look to see if there's signal in the darkness around the body part you're imaging. So again, typical chemical shift artifact, dark line on one side, white line on the other side. But you'll notice on some of the imaging that you're gonna see this artifact. Now here you see that the dark line seems to separate the muscle bands in the paraspinal region, right? So, so what, is this art, is it, what is this artifact that looks like there's a black line around here like the sternocleidomastoid muscle and so on? This is a variety of chemical shift artifact. This is called a type two artifact. And this is called phase shift cancellation. It's also called the India ink artifact or a cartooning artifact. You know, remember when you look, when you, when you do a drawing and as a, as a cartoon, you'll see that black line around all of the uh, items. So this occurs at a muscle fat interface. It's almost always seen on gradient echo imaging with a short TE. And this is the result of cancellation of the net magnetization of protons and water when they're precisely out of phase. So this is a variation of chemical shift, as I say, also called type two chemical shift artifact. So look for that artifact. So again, uh, coming back to this 3T versus 1.5T, the advantage is we can have either faster imaging thinner slices or more detailed imaging. And at a lot of sites in, uh, certainly in the United States where, where there's a premium placed on uh, volume and throughput, the, many of the advantages of 3Tesla have been dedicated to providing faster imaging. But again, the power deposition goes up, the size of the susceptibility artifacts go up and 
chemical, as chemical shift goes up. Now, susceptibility artifacts uh, are something that you're, you should be familiar with. And again, this is the same patient with an aneurysm clip imaged here at 1.5 T and imaged here at 3 Tesla. And so look at the size of the artifact here at 3 Tesla, and here is the size of the artifact at 1.5 T. So in your patients who have metal, uh, a common circumstance is uh, 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 we're asked to do, say, cervical imaging after surgery or lumbar spine imaging after surgery where there's been placement of hardware. If you want to maximize your chance of visualizing the spinal canal uh, and minimizing the artifact from the metal, my approach would be to image the patient at 1.5 Tesla if you have a choice of scanners and to use Fastman Echo T2. If you can't see through the artifact on a Fastman Echo T2 sequence, which of course has the least metal artifact or susceptibility artifact, then, then none of the other pulse sequences are gonna be of any benefit. Now, susceptibility in, uh, artifacts are based on the fact that we need a uniform static magnetic field. And remembering this Larmor equation that frequency is proportional to the precessional frequency is proportional to the magnetic field. So anything that distorts the magnetic field, and this occurs at brain bone interface, and particularly in metal, will have loss of signal. So here's the same patient here at three Tesla. You'll see these artifacts that are arising here. This is gonna be at the sphenoid sinus. We're gonna get this signal where at 1.5 Tesla, the artifacts are less evident. Now, we usually think of susceptibility artifacts as bad, uh, but you can uh, often see things uh, by maximizing susceptibility artifact. For example, when you're looking for cavernomas in the brain uh, or you're looking for hemorrhage in patients after trauma, these shear hemorrhages that occur at the gray weight interface, uh, these are op uh, maximized by using three Tesla and pulse sequences that can exaggerate that. For example, this is the same patient imaged in the axial plane. This is fast echo T2. Here I see the spinal cord. I can see this line of subarachnoid space around the spinal cord, in fact, all the way around the cord. And while there may be a little compromise of the canal, uh, there certainly doesn't look like there's any compression of the cord. But this is a shallow flip angle gradient scan. Here, actually, you can tell that from this uh, chemical shift artifact. But notice that the canal looks much narrower. This is due to this susceptibility artifact arising from hardware in the spine. And this, uh, this effect is called blooming, which is characteristic of susceptibility effect. And this is the same patient. Here you see the hardware, which is due to uh, anterior plating and some inner body screws. But we see the spinal cord here on the T1, but on the gradient echo scan, the canal looks much narrower. So again, uh, this uh, awareness of this problem should uh, direct you if you're imaging patients, for example, after spine surgery, you wanna stay away from shallow flip angle gradient imaging, uh, and you wanna to move towards uh, fast echo T2 imaging whenever possible to minimize that artifact. Now here's, as an example, some susceptibility artifacts. This is a cavernoma in the pons. And here you see the central uh, T1 shortening from the blood products. And this is the complete hemosiderin ring, which you can see well on the fast Echo T2 scan. And you see all the detail you see in the cavernoma. But as you look on the diffusion scan, now this is a uh, uh, echo planar scan, which is very sensitive to uh, effects of susceptibility. We have no detail, uh, and we and we see this little rind of T of sorry high signal intensity, which is very common with susceptibility artifacts. In a sense, we have this displaced signal. Now, this is a susceptibility weighted scan. Of course, this is a scan is designed to maximize susceptibility artifacts. And you see, again, we have no detail within the cavernoma because we're sort of overwhelmed now by the susceptibility effects. Now, as we talk about some of the benefits in uh, trying to maximize the susceptibility artifact, 
Here we see a patient uh, after trauma, and the question is, are there sheer hemorrhages? And this is the T1-weighted scan. Sorry, this is the T1-weighted scan, and this is the susceptibility-weighted scan at the same level. And here you can see these areas of signal dropout. These are due to hemorrhages uh, usually occurring at the gray-white interface. Uh, it looks like we have a little different angle on this uh, scan. We're close, but here you can see some of the blood products in the dependent portion of the ventricles. And it looks like there's a hemorrhage here in the midbrain, which is actually a poor prognostic sign. Now, this is actually a good sign, though. Here, if you look in the orbits, you see that there's this distortion of the globe. And you see the high signal intensity here, the distortion and the high signal intensity. This is an artifact. This is an artifact from eye makeup, probably something that you see if you look for it in your practice. But this is a variation of susceptibility effect, usually caused by the pigments in eye makeup, and a good reason why in patients that you image who, uh, particularly if you're interested in the orbits to patients, to have the patients uh, come without makeup or to take their makeup on off before you image them. But there are some situations, of course, where 3T is just better. And the two examples that come to mind for me are MRA. Uh, we get these exquisite MRA scans at three Teslas. So if there's ever a question about could the patient have an aneurysm, then by all means, you want to do it at three Tesla. And the other uh, is anytime you're looking for high detail, uh, particularly epilepsy imaging, where you're trying to resolve the structure within the hippocampal formation that you can see here on this coronal T2 weighted scan. So again, there, there are pros and cons to imaging at both pulse sequences, but you need to be aware of these if you wanna optimize the imaging for your patient. Now there are ways of mitigating some of these artifacts. For example, if you wanna mitigate the susceptibility artifacts at three Tesla, uh, you wanna avoid scans that use gradient echo imaging, you want to choose a longer bandwidth, use thinner slices, and shorter TE times. And if you're doing orthopedic imaging, for example, ankle imaging or wrist imaging, uh, you want to uh, use IV bags or special MR pads to minimize the artifacts at the air-skin interface. Now, this is uh, an example of how susceptibility artifacts influence the imaging. This, this is an artifact that you see here. It looks like there's a high-grade stenosis or occlusion of the middle cerebral artery, but this is uh, arising from an aneurysm clip that you can see on the static imaging, and here you see on the source image from the MRA. Notice again that we have signal loss with this rind of high signal intensity, and so this is due to this dephasing of signal in the area of the metal. Now, this is a pitfall that you have to be aware of when you're doing flare imaging. Very easy to mistake this artifact for subarachnoid blood. We see, as expected on flare imaging, suppression of the CSF within the ventricular CSF and in the subarachnoid space, but we have high signal intensity here in the sulci. So this looks exactly like either subarachnoid blood or pus you might see in meningitis. But you have to look for any other evidence of artifacts. And this is a little odd looking here. And here we see much more graphically these artifacts in a different patient. And again, this unsuppressed CSF. And so uh, flare is very sensitive to susceptibility effects. So patients with dental hardware, braces, and so on can cause there to be local uh, incomplete suppression of CSF. Do not mistake this for an abnormality of the subarachnoid space. So again, when you see high signal intensity in the subarachnoid space, the things to consider are obviously susceptibility effects, as in this case, pus, blood, and in some cases, you're gonna see leakage of gadolinium uh, if you have a patient with say a meningioma or a surface tumor where the gadolinium can actually leak out into the subarachnoid space and also give you incomplete suppression of CSF. Now, if you want to mitigate chemical shift artifacts, obviously you can image at a lower field strength. 
you can use fat suppression, again, which, which is going to take away this fat uh, water interface, and to avoid these type 2 artifacts, avoid gradient echo imaging, and replace it with a spin echo sequence. The other thing is when you're imaging in 3.2, again, using a high bandwidth will reduce the chemical shift artifact. But keep in mind that this also reduces signal and noise. And again, signal and noise was why we were imaging at three Tesla to begin with. So, so uh, this is you know, sort of end up coming back, uh, meeting yourself in the middle. Now, this is a pretty dramatic chemical shift artifact you see here in this patient with retinal detachment. And one of the treatments that's used is to instill silicone uh, into the uh, vitreous space. And this into, uh, into to try to uh, decrease the, uh, uh, increase the pressure on the retina. And so this is this uh, chemical shift artifact that arises between silicone and water, which is often quite graphic. Now, susceptibility effects can lead to artifacts uh, that will uh, lead to a misdiagnosis um, and, and look for inadvertent um, water suppression at the periphery of images. Now, for example, here, uh, it's easy to mistake in these cases uh, an abnormality of the marrow space here in the, in the area of the sacrum and the uh, low thoracic spine. But you'll also see there's incomplete fat suppression in the sub, uh, subcutaneous fat at the, around the same levels. And this is an artifact that's occurring at the edges of a surface coil. <clears throat> and remember, if you want to have even fat suppression, you're better off with STIR than chemical fat suppression. This is chemical fat suppressed T2 weighted imaging. But again, this can lead to misdiagnosis. So for example, this same patient, you can see from the morphology of the disc, same patient being imaged. One of these is STIR and one is chemical fat suppression. And after what I just told you, you would predict then that this is going to be the STIR image. And this, the other one is the chemical fat suppression by the artifacts you see here in the subcutaneous fat. Now, this is a problem that I've seen occur. It doesn't happen often, but it's very important because it can lead to a misdiagnosis. In one case, in my experience, led to, uh, to a treatment that wasn't necessary. This is post-gadolinium T1-weighted fat suppressed scans of the orbits. And so obviously this side looks different than this side, which could lead you to suspect that there is something enhancing in the, uh, in the orbit and orbital apex, uh, which will uh, obviously bring up uh, questions about an infiltrative tumor and the like. But if you look on the coronal scan, you see there's this little bit of distortion you see at the edge of the orbit. There's a little bit on the other side, and this is due to the air in the maxillary sinuses, but uh, any sort of dental artifact, you see again, uh, you see the artifact here in the maxillary sinus. So dental metal can influence the appearance, obviously, of the maxillary sinus, but this can extend up into the orbit. And so in cases like this, where we use chemical fat suppression, uh, rather than stir imaging to suppress the fat, uh, it can lead to this incomplete fat suppression. Now, why do we use uh, uh, chemical fat suppression and not stir uh, in cases where we give gadolinium? It's important to recognize that STIR will suppress all things with short T1 relaxation time. So the STIR scan doesn't care, care whether we're looking at fat, blood products, contrast, anything with a short T1 relaxation time will be suppressed on STIR images. The only way you're gonna see the difference between T1 shortening from contrast and T1 shortening from fat is to use a specific chemical uh, suppression of uh, fat. So uh, this is an important distinction, and you need to be aware of the pros and cons of using STIR and fat suppression. So again, this is a, a T1-weighted fat suppressed post-GAD, and here's flare scan 
and if you look on the this scan, it looks like there's enhancement in this location and here and on the flare scan, maybe a little bit of increased signal. This is another variety of susceptibility artifact that's occurring at the tops of the petrous bones. So again, this is very common to see this artifact at three Tesla imaging and make sure you don't mistake this for uh, abnormal enhancement. Here, a better demonstrated here on the sagittal scan, you notice again, little distortion here, this dark area with a bright rim. This is a susceptibility artif artifact arising at the top of the petrous bone as it uh, uh, sort of approaches the uh, inferior aspect of the temporal lobe. So again, be aware of all of these artifacts, which will be more evident at three Tesla. <coughs> Now, let's talk a little bit about contrast, because I think this is a misunderstanding by some radiologists. Three gadolinium is not more evident at three Tesla. Like here, this is from, uh, again, not like, uh, uh, I don't know what the, forget what the source of this was, but you'll see this every once in a while. Contrast on three Tesla gives you more enhancement and blah, blah, so allows you to see the contrast better. This is a misunderstanding. So there are multiple factors that contribute to the conspicuity of GAD contrast uh, on MR. And I think you remember from, uh, I think it was just the last session where Narek mentioned about delayed uh, uh, imaging after injection of contrast. So obviously time from injection influences the appearance of contrast on the images because if you let more time for the gadolinium to circulate up to a point um, that you may have more accumulation of gadolinium in weakly enhancing uh, uh, structures. So time from injection matters, dose matters, although you're probably all aware that we're, we're trending away from high dose gadolinium imaging because of this concern about gadolinium deposition. But the pulse sequences used also influences the conspicuity of gadolinium. That is mag transfer uh, will give you more conspicuity than fat suppressed T1. Fat suppressed T1 gives you more apparent contrast than T1 spin echo. I'm not sure you're aware of this, but one of the benefits, another benefit of fat suppressed T1 when you're dealing in the brain is that there's a little bit of magnetization transfer effect uh, as a result of the fat suppression pulse. And so that will also maximize or optimize the visualization of the gadolinium. So I'm actually a big fan of fat suppressed imaging in the brain. But the least conspicuous scan is gradient echo. Field strength does have a, has a uh, uh, effect, but it's confusing. So higher doses of gadolinium are more conspicuous at 3T, but low dose is less conspicuous. So uh, keep in mind, as I mentioned, that how pulse sequences in, increase or decrease uh, the conspicuity of contrast. Now, MP rage or the like is one of the techniques used, that's used at three Tesla. Now we use that pulse sequence because it increases the T1 contrast between gray and white matter. Now, MP rage is a gradient echo technique and it uses a flip angle of 60 rather than 90. The reason we use MP rage then is to make an accommodation to the lower intrinsic T1 contrast at higher field strength. But as a result, we're using a gradient echo technique uh, uh, to decrease the power deposition. So how does that affect gadolinium? Well, uh, let me give you this example. This was from a uh, journal of neurosurgery and the title of the paper you can see was spontaneous resolution and redemonstration of an untreated glioblastoma. Well, I found this very interesting paper. And what they demonstrated in the article was this lesion in the temporal lobe that was enhancing. When the patient came for, to their hospital for biopsy, they said, lo and behold, right, the contrast disappeared. They canceled the biopsy. 
And then they brought the patient back. And of course, it was a glioblastoma, it was larger, and then they finally did biopsy it. So we wrote a letter to them uh, that was published uh, in response to this, pointing out that, be, that, that what they really were looking at was the decreased conspicuity of the contrast on MP rage, and it wasn't spontaneous resolution of the enhancement. And the reason we knew about this is this is a patient we had. This patient was sent in from an outside hospital. Here you can see the outside scan. You can see this enhancing lesion in the periventricular white matter in a patient with lung cancer. The patient came in for an evaluation at our hospital. We did MP rage. You can see there's no enhancement here. And then later on, patient came back a month later because we weren't happy about this discrepancy. And now you can see the lesion is larger. We biopsied and this was metastatic disease from the patient's lung cancer. So be aware of this limitation of MP rage and high field imaging is that contrast can be less conspicuous. And so when you're evaluating patients with brain tumors, you, I would, my recommendation is to stick with standard T1 spin echo imaging and be careful about mixing imaging at three Tesla and 1.5. So again, coming back to this idea of conspicuity, here is, um, this looks like T1, and this is the three Tesla scan. Look how, how hard it is to see this enhancing lesion compared to the 1.5T. So again, this patient was uh, done with MP rage and T1 weighted. This is T1 weighting, this is MP rage. You see the, this lesion is much less conspicuous than it is at the, um, on, on the MP rage compared to the T1 technique. So again, by all means use MP rage or SPGR for gray white contrast, but don't assume that the GAD contrast will be more apparent. Well, I, I said at the outset that we were gonna talk a little bit about flow and flow is a, is a very complicated, uh, on MR is a very complicated subject to, to get into. I'm just gonna touch on one aspect of this uh, uh, at the end here. So we'll talk about the 3D time of flight versus 2D time of flight. So both techniques are used uh, for visualization of vasculature that can be done without the use of gadolinium enhancement. Now, 3D time of flight is not as sensitive to direction of flow as 2D time of flight. 2D time of flight best used in the cervical region where we, have, we know the flow goes up and down. But while it, while get, it is uh, less sensitive than 2D time of flight direction, uh, it also is less sensitive to slow flow. And so 3D time of flight is best when we're trying to deal with vessels that turn and we're looking at high velocity flow. Well, that's, that's by definition, right? If you think about the middle cerebral artery or the anterior cerebral artery, there, it's full of turns and loops. So if we wanna see those structures, we wanna use 3D time of flight imaging. And, and so high velocity flow is by nature, what we're looking at is the arterial flow and it minimizes some of the venous flow. So 3D time of flight is optimal when we're trying to visualize the arteries in the brain. 2D time of flight is better when we're looking at flow of varying velocities, which again, if we're looking at, let's for example, a patient with a carotid stenosis, where you potentially could have slower flow in one carotid than another, 2D time of flight is better in the neck. And it's also why we use 2D time of flight for MR venography. 2D time of flight, because it's an acquisition of multiple thin slices, but you can do that indefinitely. I'm sure some of you have seen MRAs of the lower extremities. You can do that throughout half the body, all the body, where 3D time of flight is limited because we're dealing with slab acquisition. So again, three-dimensional acquisitions and the flow becomes suppressed. The spins become suppressed as they go through the slabs. So we have poor anatomic coverage with 3D time of flight. And both 3D time of flight and 2D time of flight can be confounded by structures <coughs> with short T1 relaxation time. And this is an artifact called shine through. 
So let's look at this. Uh, this is a, a series of images that and just shows you these are the source images from 3D time of flight. Now, you'll notice all of a sudden, high signal intensity appears in the fourth ventricle and then disappears. So now we see clear fourth ventricle signal in the fourth ventricle. So I'm using this as a demonstration to show you, uh, in a sense, one of the artifacts that you're gonna see, you see the way there's a sharp line here and we have this signal in the upper portion of the fourth ventricle. This has to do with the way 3D time of flight is acquired. Even though this looks like this is a single acquisition, there's actually two slabs here. One is here and the other one is here. So this is this technique called MOTSA, uh, multiple overlapping thin slab acquisition. So these slabs are then knitted together and there's a little bit of overlap. So they call this stitching them together. Now here, this is, a, this is these are acquired from uh, clinical scans. And these are unfortunate examples where we have poor stitching together of the slabs. So this is one slab, here's another slab, here's another slab. Here we see high signal intensity at the interface. Here we have low signal intensity at the interface. Now, why, why do we acquire slabs this way? It has to do with this property of saturation of spins and probably better demonstrated on this scan. So as the protons enter from below, remember flow is coming from inferior to superior in the cerebral circulation, we have a lot of signal at the bottom part of the slab because we're using this property of entry slice enhancement. As the spins move through the slab, we lose signal. And you see the signals dropping out, it's dropping out until we reach the end of the slab now, if we were to continue, and if we had made the slab much larger, we would eventually probably have no signal. But now we, we know, we, we anticipate this problem. So we do multiple thin slabs. So this is the next slab. Again, high signal intensity drops off as we get out into the middle cerebral arteries. And again, now we're into the next slab and we have see high signal intensity. So this is an artifact that you can see on time of flight imaging, 3D time of flight imaging in the brain. There are ways you can mitigate this. One way is a, a technique called tone, but you modify the flip angle as, as we go through the acquisition. But again, this is a pitfall and don't mistake this for a disease of, for example, the middle cerebral arteries look for this artifact where the slab interfaces occur. Now, in terms of this insensitivity of 3D time of flight to slow flow, let's take this case. This patient has a mass at the, in the paracellar region. And the question would come up, is this an aneurysm? Could this be a meningioma? And so as we look on the 3D time of flight MRA source image, you see there's high signal intensity in the carotid here, high signal intensity in the basilar artery, and very little signal is arising from this paracellar mass. And so you would look at that and say, mistakenly, unfortunately, you might say, well, that's probably not a vascular structure because look how little signal we're getting from it. But this is the CTA of the same patient, and this, of course, is a giant aneurysm. So why does it lesion show very different signal from the carotid on the other side. This is because of slow flow. So this is a large aneurysm, very slow flow. And so we don't have the same quality of signal we do in the high velocity structures. Here's a patient presenting with worst headache of life. And so here we see on the 3D time of flight MRA, it looks like there's a area of high signal intensity over here. But if you look on the T1 scan, there's something that's intrinsically bright there. Sorry, these are clicking through. And here's the angiogram and there's no aneurysm in this case. And so this is an area, probably a bit of blood products that's shining through. Here's another example. 
Here's a patient with, you can see there's subarachnoid blood in the prepontine cistern. If we look on the 3D time of flight MRA, you see the basilar artery, and it looks like, like to me, it really looks like there's an aneurysm sticking out to the side. This is what the reconstruction looked like of the MRA. It looks like a saccular aneurysm arising from the superior cerebellar artery. Here's the angiogram. This patient, we were so convinced this was an aneurysm, the patient went to angio. Here's the superior cerebellar artery. There's no aneurysm there. And if you look carefully at the T1 weighted scan, some of the blood products have converted here and have a short T1 relaxation time. So this is a so-called shine through artifact. So I've tried to show you some of the pitfalls of 3D time of flight imaging. In important to keep in mind as you look at this imaging, uh, it's not as simple as it might appear in the sense that on 3D time of flight imaging, not everything that is, uh, that is bright or dark uh, tells you oh, its vascular nature. Uh, if you wanna learn more about uh, imaging physics, you can go to my Instagram site, it's called Rad Physics, and uh, I have a free iBook that's available on iTunes. Uh, it's called Top 10 MR Artifacts, if you want to search for that. Uh, and that's all I really have today. I know I covered a lot of material, uh, but if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to take those now.